the same time, now we are in a different space, and that's why then that that very limited window, I think, is is when you get feedback from the public that the school administration is in the business of lying or being deceitful. No, that's not what this policy is. But there is there is a very limited space where that goes on, where you know soon have the choice, right? Like they can be like, listen, it's okay, use use my non-chosen name because I just that's I, it's a lot of paperwork. It's not as important to me. It will make things go smoother. There's the student that says, no, it's very important to me, but I also don't. I want to switch. So they need. We need to have that, but it all. But so that I, that's what I'm zooming in yeah. on. So Dave has figured out a way to ask him to make all that work. I can't. I'm not so, the right person. Yeah, no, to answer the questions, no, but I do know that there is a process. There's a technology. Yeah. There's a technology way. What I'm yes. getting at is in this policy. Yep. What triggers oh. the administration, or what yes. triggers BPS to set to to say gotcha. we're going to do something like that? It's the plan. At the bottom, like it's still not very specific. And that <coughs> risks and safety. Yeah. So that brings us full circle on this very limit, very, very limited application. Those two words are part of it, which brings us back to the conversation we just had about the law. Yeah. Yeah. If you were to look at the plan in Aubrey, I don't know if you have it in front of you, but there's a section. Sorry, I, I yeah. can only like, I can hear like in and out. I can't oh, okay. hear that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that on the actual plan, there's a section that's called confidentiality. There's a section that's called parent guardian involvement. There's a section that's called student safety, school safety. Yep. Um, so there are all of those components that are part of the plan um, that is very unique to each student. These plans never look the same for, for students because they are developed um, in the moment and then over time with that student and, and hopefully their families. And then the, the gender support plan is going to be a, uh, it's listed as a reference, is that going to be part of the policy, an example of it? Yes, so um, I think that's we would leave it, we okay. would leave it as yep. um, part of that on the website, so anyone who wanted to see what that plan, a blank plan looks like, you can see it. But will it be part of the policy? Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I, I see no reason why it shouldn't be into it. I don't. So oftentimes what we've done with those is we've had the policy and then we have the under the protocol or the plan, right? So that if something does need to be adjusted, we don't bring all the data back through. But if we want to have it as part of the policy, we can also do that. Yeah. Yeah. The vast majority of times, I think that makes sense given the topic. And you feel pretty good, Paula, that this is in a good place and it doesn't need any major refinement. I do because okay. we've had one in place for several years. Yeah. So it so it should it should be an attachment to the official policy of that. So then the only part would be that anybody who is using it, if they felt like it needed to be changed, that needs to come back, come back to policy, to policy, to policy yeah. so that we can adjust it.
motion to move public comment under gender support policy and protocol? So moved. So this is an opportunity if you have um, uh, anything to share regarding the work that we just did regarding the policy. I know it's hard to hear because this room, and it sounds like we have bands starting next door, but um, uh, if you have any specific recommendations or requirements, this will be going back to the school committee for um, for us another read um, at the February 1st, I February 1st, a week from today. Um, it will be on that, on that agenda. <coughs> Is it possible? I know there was a lot of conversation. To just summarize the amendments that were just yep. the suggestions so, were just made. Yep. So the Thank just you. was mostly clarification. So uh, the first item was um, to define who the teams are that are working with students. Um, and for elementary, it's a different team for elementary and for secondary, um, and that they involve the student. For the elementary, they involve the family. For the secondary, they involve family if the student is okay with that. Then they also involve the guidance counselor, social worker, psychologist, and a, an administrator of the school. Um, the second change happened when we talked about um, if secondary school students are not yet comfortable talking to their parents and, and um, disclosing to their parents, then what that looks like. And because the uh, recommendation had been that it somehow is at least touched by the superintendent so the superintendent is aware that that has happened and so we just clarified that um, that it's not, an approval. it's not an approval it's just that the superintendent is aware because some people were concerned that the superintendent was making that decision and he, he's not um, but if he or she has concerns about that decision he they will um, reach back to the team um, We added in the in the purpose that um, the policy would be also one of the purposes of the policy is to engage and to encourage the student to engage with their parents or their family. Um, it doesn't require it, but it encourages that that's going to happen. Um, and then we also clarified that the school has no role in physical or medical transition, um, and that we do not make recommendations regarding either of those topics. Thank you. Those were the And um, Aubrey was going to help us put some, um, discuss the risks and safety, um, but also <coughs> what the group decided um, that the intent is not to uh, box in our professionals, but also provide guidance to the public so that they understand what the intent is and what it's not. So given that, we did we moved our public comment, so if there's anybody that would like to make a public comment at this time, um, we welcome your feedback at, at their replies. You can say, great job. <laughs> <It's all good. laughs> Whichever works. Is there anybody that would like to make a public comment? Yes? I'm Amy Nunn. I'm um, executive director of the Rhode Island Public Health Institute, and we own and operate Open Door Health, which is the space first and only LGBTQ clinic. Um, I want to just applaud you all for um, moving um, the dialogue in a progressive uh, direction. Also, um, just want to note that all of the psychological harms to gender diverse persons ultimately culminate in medical harms at some point or another. And um, it's really important that we take a whole person view of health and well-being, and um, that we also not um, adopt any policies that in any way um, implicitly or explicitly endorse uh, discrimination, because there will be health harms to people uh, immediately or later in life after the cumulative impact of all those things are realized on their health. Um, so I want to thank you all and applaud you for um, for um, endorsing protections for gender diverse persons. And also, we want to be a resource. We take care of a lot of um, adolescents and adults um, at Open Door Health. And our name says it all, our door is open. We, we want to take care of people. Um, we want to be a partner with the school district. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Jared Ryan, 99 Rocky Street, Darrington, Rhode Island. 
I just wanted to say um, you guys do a lot of good work in your policy meetings, but uh, there needs to be uh, more clarity for what's considered unsafe. Uh, there needs to be more clarity at, at which point you're planning on cutting parents out of the conversation. And there needs to be uh, some kind of a better angle of integrating or actually mandating some kind of integration of uh, bringing the family in, at least the parents, giving them a clue, it's like, hey, you know, perhaps we can work the parents in and see, you know, how far along it goes and see if it is, if it is actually safe or not. Because I don't, I don't see that here. You know, I'd like, hopefully too bad the psychologist isn't here today to clarify what's unsafe, but that's definitely a, a need. And if I was cut out of my child's life, because of um, a couple of people just coming together trying to, with well-intended purposes, I would kind of wonder why. Because my son, if he was lying or considered it to be unsafe, and I would actually want to know that even, just so I could play along and see how it goes one way or the other. Whether it's to affirm or whether it's to seek a different way or a different guidance of help. Parents need to be involved. It's not for the school to guide them in the direction. It has to be a participation between the family and the school. The school is not the parent, especially when it comes to mental health. Thank you. should have stated, I, I'm a Barrington resident, also my address is 20 Clark Road, and I do have children in the school system. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Rachel Gross, I'm a medical practitioner, uh, I do very fair, I also specialize in transgender health. Um, thanks for all of your hard work on this today. Um, you know, I think Chair brings up some great points, and you know, the individual from Open Door brings up great points. First, I want to thank you. I know that this is tough, and it's a tough time to talk about it. Um, you know, and I think it seems like you've been doing a lot of work on it. There are a couple things. I do agree that sort of probably delineating some safety things might be helpful, right, for everyone. Um, I think mental health certainly, you know, the interesting thing to me of hearing this was is like, certainly there must be other policies within the district about safety plans and mental health. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I kind of wanted to challenge a little bit is that gender affirming care, whether it's in school or in a family, is not necessarily always like a bad or scary thing or even a safety thing. It's really about like empowering. Um, and so it's interesting that this policy has been created to be like, we can give you these protections if you feel like you're unsafe. I don't necessarily think it's always just not being safe. It's really affirming and empowering. Um, and so I think, and one of the things we were talking about how, um, you know, in order to change name in the chart, trust me, I work with an electronic health record system. I, I understand the burden. Um, but I think there was some stuff in there about defining the risk and safety in the event that they feel unsafe that would sort of um, give credence to changing the name. And so I wanted to push back a little bit and just say that I don't, I don't know that there has to be a risk for safety in order to change it. It can just be affirming their names whatsoever. Um, and then the other thing is some of this puts a little bit of a burden on the student in some ways to like have enough to like get together to come forward and be like, hi, I'm such and such, I want this. Um, so I appreciate that you all are here and just want to make sure that the language is um, developmentally on par with the expectations of the student as it's important to exist. Um, you all are doing really great work, and um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. I guess I'll just say I am a school social worker <laughs> at the elementary school. Um, I was going to be quiet because I just wanted to see how the meeting went, um, and I have a license as a clinical social worker with the state of Rhode Island, and I have extensive training um, 
and have done many hours supervised under um, licensed clinicians. And so the training that we receive um, and the experience that I have is what gives me the <coughs> qualifications to help assess. Um, but ultimately, I would never try to keep a child from telling their parents, and that's part of the ethical standards that we live by as a professional. Um, so in my experience and my clinical opinion, um, that would never be how I interpreted. Um, and I can understand why you have fears and have worries that someone wouldn't share. I have complete, I feel that. I feel that. I feel the, like the worry myself um, if someone were to do that with me. But it's not just that I'm going to go home and starve. You know, it's, it's like there's like this level of, you know, or maybe it is that you're going to starve, but it's, there's this, You've known that student kind of come through your school. Hopefully you do. If they're new, you don't. Maybe some, they might have moved into district. But hopefully you know the child's mannerisms, behavior. There's something in body language that we assess when we're working with students and families. Um, we reach out to families all the time and really get a sense of, you know, if they want to work with us and help their child, if they're scared, if there's barriers, if there's trauma to, like, reasons why they may not be open to doing certain things and we then try to support that and make things better and just help that child feel supportive because ultimately, like you said, research and data shows that having that supportive family is number one. Like, and, and all this language in this policy is exactly like, I read it really quick before I came, so I'm like, it's exactly what's in the Rhode Island Elementary um, guidance and in the laws from the United um, States Department of Education. And I'll be honest, I think we're going to be able to get some money for the town because there are, there are grants through the U.S. government, I mean, you probably have already looked at them, I'm sure, but there's grants for service, grants for mental health, there is service money for trainings, like, we need to just bring more, I think, information into the town and the community, and, um, yeah, that's kind of all I have to say, because I kind of have to defend, I guess, myself, I'm at the elementary, um, at Soames and Primrose, um, Michelle Marcel, I don't know if I introduced myself. Um, but I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been here for about five, uh, five years this year, and I was in um, North Providence prior to this for three years. Um, and before that, I was doing HPTS and PASS for um, home-based services, and before that, I worked at Meeting Street, and before that, I was at St. Mary's Home for Children. <laughs> so I feel like I would have a good sense, and I would, again, never try to keep a child from their parents. May I double dip? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Jared Ryan, 999 Rockets here at Barrington. Um, well, when we had our child in elementary school, we had experiences of bullying, a little off topic, but we didn't get notified of certain elements of bullying. We didn't get notified of certain violations of, uh, of written actual instances that happened for bullying cases. We found out the hard way from having a teacher call us and say, hey, I hope your son feels safe coming back to school tomorrow. Well, you know, that would raise an eyebrow or two. So in light of certain events and commentary, I would have to say it's all in well intended, but in practical application, is it going to be used the way it's supposed to? And that's the important part about the policy. Uh, my name is Laura Sant. I'm a manual drive. I have two children in the school system. They are both high schoolers. And um, this policy for real seems like it's in a really good place to start. I really do. I think it's coming from a long position place. And, you know, I've had children that have not had these experiences here. They don't have body sizes that are typical. So, I mean, there's a lot of things about, you know, people, the children are targeted for. You know, living in a larger body, uh, being not LGBTQ, maybe not necessarily trans, you know, but we have all sorts of experiences in our lives. We're children on the spectrum. I'm just telling you as a single parent, I've seen it when it works, and yes, when it's failed. But the, the failures are opportunities, and I always work with, and I have opportunities to work with principals, superintendents, email people. My name is. Probably on, you could see emails from the from the school committee. I mean, I think it's all about communication, right? So you have an outlet for this, and it's really important. What's also important to know is I'm a nurse. I'm also a director of risk management. 
personalized health care that goes gender affirming care. And we're very proud of the work we do at Autonomous Health Center, and you know we're, we're here to support you writing good policy, and, and then we'll, we'll do whatever we can to make that happen. Because ultimately, as a resident of this town, and my children have been there since they were in Primrose, and there has been moments where you're right, it works, it doesn't, but we can communicate and continue to make it better. But ultimately, the holistic approach that you spoke about is really what it is, and each child is unique. It does have to be tailored to the child. And when we speak about risk, I want to be really clear that like risk presents in all different ways, and it can be. I don't know. I know about when I said it. I no, like, no, 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 yeah, no. I'm just saying, like you're absolutely right. It, the risk could be the child decides I'm not going to eat because I'm so scared. And I do think that my colleagues right here that like when we think about the onus on the child, you had said, um, I'm sorry, ma'am, I forgot your name, but you had said, Dr. Dylan or Lena Douglas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had said. If the child feels they can have that conversation with the principal, then you know they'll get that accommodated for the single occupancy. That's a lot of pressure to put on a child to ask for themselves. It's just to be mindful of mine that my son literally with his guidance counselor who just helped him take courses. We have to show you emails, we have to email because he can't have a face to face meeting with her. His social anxiety is that loud, I'd rather. And he's not dealing with any, you know, body image issues or identity issues. Now you put and all that other stuff, and maybe the parents know, maybe they don't. But I'm just saying, I think if you're in a good place, keep these things in mind. Risk, I do think does have to be better defined, and we can certainly support and suggest that and help that in any way as a resource. And again, I want to thank you for having a very forward thinking policy. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I say something really quickly? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay, wait, someone else gonna? I was just gonna say, to, to your point, I actually am hearing what you're saying, and there should be a certain level of like notification for if things are happening at the school. So like taking it to a different level, like if your child's being threatened at school, it's different. Like we're assessing the risk for threat from the parent. So that's why, like when you're, I I can see it as two different you know areas, but I can <clears> totally <throat> understand. Like I would want to be not like notified, if, you know. But so maybe that's in that bullying policy that we, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Peter Spencer, uh, to Joanne Drive. Grateful to be here today. Thanks for all your work. I've got three kids in elementary school, middle school, and high school. And uh, I'll be honest with you, um, if we we're reopening this policy and looking at adding to it, I think we should look at more than just the language that you're proposing today. I, I'm greatly concerned with any indication that a school or a staff member or teacher would keep anything from a parent. I mean, you look at the language here. It says here where a, child, a student does not want their parents to know or if it carries risk to the student or if the safety cannot be guaranteed. That's a, if, there's, if the safety of a child cannot be guaranteed, that's not a school decision to make. That's when you call DCYF. That's when you call the police. There's no mention of that anywhere in this policy. So, if, if a, so you think about the scenario, a young man, a young woman comes to the guidance counselor and says, I don't want to be known by this name anymore. I want to be known by this name, but don't tell my parents. Okay, so the guidance counselor knows about that. They involve the administration. They involve the social worker. They involve the psychologist. You involve the team, that's what you're calling it. Guess who's not in the team? There's no parent in the team. There's no family in the team. That can't be an adequate team to care for the child. I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of an instance, in any instance, where a phone call to a parent and say, just so you know, this is happening in your child's life. They don't, want us, they don't want me to tell you this, but I have a bigger responsibility to honor your wishes as a parent than the 15-year-old. I mean, these are children we're talking about. Once they turn 18, they're adults, right? I know we want to we wanna respect their desires, We've talked a little about student choice. It's an important part of it. But what, ra what rises, what's more important, a student's choice, a children's choice, or a parent's choice? I can't think of any parent that would say, I want to be left out of my child's huge, major decision making. It's ludicrous. It makes no sense to me. I know I'm speaking very boldly here, but this is how I feel. And I know I'm not the only one that feels this way. Um, I think it's interesting tonight when you've talked about, uh, TJ, I've never met you before, but I appreciate all your work. You said, okay, 
let's talk about some of the risks. Homelessness, being beaten, right, being kicked out of the house, right off. Everyone would agree that that's terrible. And then when you sat here and said, what about another risk? You couldn't come up with one, right? You couldn't think on the spot, obviously, about the other risks that might come into play that would require a student, uh, a teacher, or a counselor to withhold information. I think that's telling. I think that's telling. The other thing, I was just, to be honest with you, kind of shocked that there would be any discussion ever between a counselor and a teacher and a student about what we will disclose and what we will not disclose to a parent in a parent-teacher conference. Your teacher's coming to talk about your, let's, let's talk about what we should tell them. Let's talk about what we shouldn't tell them. That's craziness. That's crazy that that discussion should ever take place. What you would and would not tell a parent at a parent-teacher conference. What you will and will not disclose to a parent on Aspen. In my mind, families should have full knowledge, full understanding, be included on everything, and if it harms a child, which I can see, I can see a 16-year-old saying, don't tell my parents. I don't want my uncle to know. I don't want my dad to know. He'll, he'll hurt me, call these who I am. He'll, I'm, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed. I'm sorry, you have to respect those desires, but I don't want to be that parent that everyone else in the school or many other adults in the school know this precious thing about my child and I'm kept in the dark. That's craziness. I mean, I, I appreciate the work you're doing. I honor and respect the effort of, of caring for the children. But I think we're looking way beyond the mark and trying to solve something that we're doing it the wrong way. If there's a concern of a child being at risk or having their safety at concern, the solution is not to not tell the parents. That's not the solution. The solution is to involve the parents and say, we're worried about your child. What if there's other kind of concerns? I guess that, that would be the other question. Would there be any moment in time that the teen would go against the child's wishes to tell the parent? We talk about bringing them in, it makes total sense, you want to do that the whole time. But will there ever be a moment when they said, listen, I know you don't want us to tell your parents, but we're going to do it anyway. I would hope there would be that instance. This policy does not share, show any open, openness to that. It, it, this is driven by the child's choices, by the child's decision, and their children, right? We honor them, we respect them, we give them a lot of autonomy, but at the end of the day, they're children making decisions behind the parents' backs, and I don't think a school department or anybody that works with the school department should support them in that effort. Thank you. Just uh, Carl Bloom, uh, 28, Happy and Way, American. Um, what I hear is, as the intention and the spirit of this policy is to take that moment when a student has found that level of trust with an adult to say, there's something that I'm struggling with, or there's something that I want to express, and I feel safe with you. For somebody that came out as gay at 24, I know what it feels like to carry that shame and fear through my you know, elementary school years, junior high, high school, and the biggest fear was how will my family react? And so I think, gosh, if I was you know, in junior high school, or whatever age you were talking about, and I had that one adult that I felt safe with, that would be life changing, right? And, and having that fear of how will my parents react? Will I be shamed? Will I be um, humiliated? You know, worst case scenario, be kicked out, all those other things. But before all of that is just the, uh, the emotional duress of how will my family react? And will they be ashamed of me? Um, and I hear that the intention here is to say, we want to take that seed of trust and work with you to build that and build that bridge to your family and bring in the family. But I think in terms of truly like caring for and supporting that child, it's a it's a process of building. We can't we can't just like pull the ripcord and be like, told us parents are coming in. Um, in many cases, that can just have devastating effect. Where you know if if the parent reacts in a way that they are ashamed or um, and it, again, it doesn't have to be an invisible. You know that very quickly can lead to you know suicide and you know other kinds of mental health risks. So I think it's a delicate, delicate balance between you know respecting parents and the, that primary parent relationship and you know supporting the kids in a way that you know helps them feel whole, respected, and safe, and build that bridge with the parents. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi. I'm Kelly.